This video contains solutions to practice problems from section 5.1 on sequences. For these first couple of problems, we're just practicing using the sequence notation to understand how to figure out what the numbers in our sequence actually are. So when we have an explicit formula like this, all we're being asked to do here is to figure out what's a1, what's a2, a3, and so on. We're talking about the first six terms, so we're going all the way up to a6. But in theory, this sequence goes on forever. So a1 is 1 squared minus 1, which is 0. A2 is 2 squared minus 1, which is 3, and so on. So that's all we're being asked to do is just plug these numbers into this formula that we're given. So not a lot going on in this problem. And then the sixth term is 6 squared minus 1, which is 35. And that's it. Similar problem here. Here we see this little widget here, the minus 1 to the n plus 1. All that's really doing is creating what we call an alternating sign. So when we look at the first term, which is minus 1 to the 1 plus 1 divided by 1, that's just minus 1 squared divided by 1, which is 1 over 1, which is 1. The second term of my sequence is minus 1 to the 2 plus 1 divided by 2. That's minus 1 cubed divided by 2. And minus 1 cubed is minus 1. So what we're going to see is that in this sequence, the terms alternate between positive and negative. The next term is going to be minus 1 to the 3 plus 1 divided by 3. That's going to be 1 third. third uh, fourth term, minus 1 to the 4 plus 1 divided by 4. That'll be minus 1 fourth. And hopefully we're seeing the pattern. We've got 1, minus 1 half, plus 1 third, minus 1 fourth. Next one will be plus 1 fifth. And then finally, the sixth term will be minus 1 sixth. So you're going to see this kind of uh, expression minus 1 to a power pretty frequently because it gives us a way to, in a formula, get an alternating sign, a plus or minus. So now we're being asked to actually find those kinds of formulas. So what we're looking for here is a pattern in the numbers that we're being given and trying to write that pattern as a formula. So a typical place that we're going to look for a pattern here is to see how do we get each number from the number that came before it. So if we look at from 5 to 7, 7 to 9, 9 to 11, and so on, it's pretty easy to see that what we're doing to get from each number to the next is we're adding 2. We're adding 2 to get from 5 to 7, adding 2 to get from 7 to 9, and so on. Adding 2, adding 2, adding 2. So now that we've seen the pattern, what makes sense to have as our actual formula? So let's try a couple things and see what we get. So a common uh, thing that students will try in this kind of problem is they say, oh, well, I'm adding 2, so maybe my formula is n plus 2. So does that work? Well, thinking about what we just did in the previous problems, we can write out the first terms of this sequence and see what we get. So when a is when n is 1, we get 3. So that's not quite right, but let's keep going. Let's see what we get. And then when a, n is 2, we get 4, then we get 5, 6, 7, and so on. So this is wrong for a few reasons. The first reason why it's wrong is obviously we didn't get the numbers that we wanted. But the second reason why it's wrong is that we're not getting these numbers to go up by 2. This plus 2 isn't actually achieving the pattern of the numbers going up by 2 each time. All it's doing is taking where we are in the sequence and adding 2 to that. So this is not going to give us what we want. So what would be a pattern that would give us numbers that go up by 2? Well, 2 times n, that will give us numbers that go up by 2 each time. This will give us the sequence 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. And now again, that's not right, but it's closer to what we want because it's at least giving us that recursive pattern of each number is two more than the one that came before. So is there a way to adjust this to get the numbers that we want, which are 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, and so on? So how do we get from this wrong but better answer to the answer that we want? How do we get from 2 to 5, from 4 to 7, and so on? How do we adjust this wrong answer to get a better answer? And so what hopefully you're seeing here is that actually, if I just add 3 to all of these numbers, I'll get the numbers that I want. So the answer that I'm looking for then is a sub n equals 2n plus 3. And if I plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, you'll see that I do in fact get 5, 7, 9, 11, etc. So this is a good thought process to go through. And as you do more of these, you'll get the hang of it and be able to spot these patterns a little bit more easily. All right, what about a problem like this? So what's the pattern this time? 2, 4, okay, so it goes up by 2, and then 4 to 8, it goes up by 4, okay, and then 8 to 16. So it looks like the number that we're adding each time is different, but instead with the pattern here is that we're actually doubling. So multiplying by 2, multiplying by 2, multiplying.
multiplying by two and so on, multiplying by two. So what would be a pattern that achieves that? Again, a common wrong answer here would be to say, oh, I'm multiplying by two, so maybe I'll have two times n. And again, that's not going to give us a pattern where the numbers are doubling each time, because as we saw in the previous problem, that actually gives us a pattern where the numbers add to each time. So again, this is not gonna give us what we want. So how do we achieve a pattern where our numbers are doubling each time? Well, for that, we need exponentiation. For that, we need a pattern like two to the n. And in fact, this is exactly the formula that we need for this one, because two to the first power, that's two, two to the second power, that's four, two to the third power, that's eight. And so the fact that my exponent is going up by one each time, that's what's achieving this doubling pattern that we noticed. So this is the formula that we're looking for. All right, this one's a little bit more complicated, but we can break it down. So a few things going on here. Obviously we have a fraction. We've also got an alternating sign. Notice that the first fraction is positive, the second one is negative, the third one's positive, and so on. And then we've got numbers on the top and numbers on the bottom. Okay, so let's put this together like a uh, construction project. So we've got a fraction, okay, there's my fraction bar. I've got an alternating sign, and we saw earlier in this video that the way we create an alternating sign is by having minus one to a power. Now, what do we want the power to be? Well, it's always either going to be n or n plus one. And which one of those it is depends on whether we want to start with a positive number or start with a negative number. If I put an n here, then the very first number in my sequence will be when n is one, that will be minus one to the one, which is minus one. So that would be what I would want if the first number in my sequence is negative. But the sequence I want, the first number isn't negative, the first number is positive, so I want n plus one here. Because now the first number will be positive, but the second number will be negative, third one positive, and so on. So it's always either going to be n or n plus one that you're looking for, and which one it is depends on whether you want to start with a positive or start with a negative. Okay, what do we put on the top here? Well, the top numbers in my series, uh, sequence here are two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. So those numbers just go up by one each time. And so what we're thinking to ourselves is, well, this is a lot like n, which would give me one, two, three, four, five, six. If I just had n on the top of this fraction, I would get those numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. But I don't want one, two, three, four, five, six. I want two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what I need to do is take n and add one. So if I add one to this uh, sequence n, that will give me the numbers that I want on the top of my fraction. What about on the bottom of my fraction? Well, the bottom numbers that I see are five, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, and so on. And we actually saw that sequence earlier in this video. We saw that that was two n plus three. And again, we would figure that out if we hadn't just done it, we would figure that out using the process that we learned in that previous example. So this is the formula that we're looking for here. So when you see something more complicated like this, just break it down, break down the pieces. In this case, we had three pieces. We had an alternating sign, we had a top number and we had a bottom number, and we just broke them down one at a time. Now for these last few examples, we're gonna be looking at trying to find the limit of a sequence. So we're gonna apply some of the same techniques that we learned to find limits earlier in this course. And for this one, one of the techniques that we know is that when we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial, we can divide top and bottom by the highest power of our variable. In this case, we have n squared on the top and n squared on the bottom. So we're gonna take our n squared divided by three n squared minus n plus one and divide top and bottom by n squared. So when we do that, we'll get one on the top on the bottom, when we break up that uh, expression into separate fractions, we get three n squared divided by n squared minus n divided by n squared plus one divided by n squared. So that'll be one divided by three plus, sorry, minus n, one over n and then plus one over n squared. So as n goes to infinity, one over n, that's gonna go to zero. One over n squared will also go to zero. And so what we'll end up with here is one third. So that's a really common technique that can be helpful, like I said, when we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. What about something like this? Well, it looks pretty complicated. We got a square root, we got an E, lots of stuff going on. But again, break it down. Look inside that square root and say, what's going to happen as N gets bigger and bigger? Well, nothing is gonna to happen to the four, right? The four is just gonna stay being a four. 
but 1 divided by e to the n, we know that y equals e to the x looks like this. So we know that when x gets bigger, e to the x goes off to infinity, which means e to the n is also going to go off to infinity. So we're thinking of this like 1 divided by infinity. Of course, that's nonsense, but that's the idea, is 1 divided by a number that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which means this is going to go to 0. So in the limit, the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression, square root of 4 plus 1 over e to the n, is going to just be the square root of 4 plus 0. That's the square root of 4, also known as 2. So this idea of, well, what's happening to the top, what's happening to the bottom, it's a good way to break down these kinds of uh, problems involving fractions. Speaking of fractions, now we have an expression that looks like this, and now the problem is that both the top and the bottom of this fraction are going to infinity. 2 to the n is going to go to infinity as n goes to infinity, and n squared is going to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. So this is what we call an infinity over infinity type of problem. And one of the tools that we have for attacking these kinds of problems is L'Hopital's rule. And L'Hopital's rule applies to continuous functions. So what L'Hopital's rule would tell us to do is instead, let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity of 2 to the x divided by x squared. Still infinity over infinity, but L'Hopital's rule says, well, what you can do is you can take the derivative of the top and the bottom, and then if that limit exists or is infinity or minus infinity, then your original limit will be the same thing. So the derivative of 2 to the x is 2 to the x times the natural log of 2. That's a derivative you might have learned back in calculus 1. And on the bottom, I get 2x. Now, natural log of 2 there is just a constant multiple, and 2 to the x is still going off to infinity, and 2x is also going off to infinity. So L'Hopital's rule can apply again. It's still infinity over infinity. Now when we take another derivative, we get 2 to the x times the natural log of 2 times the natural log of 2 again, because we get an extra factor when we take another derivative. On the bottom, we just get the number 2. So now what's happening is the top of this fraction is going to infinity, and the bottom of this fraction is going to 2. So this is kind of like infinity over 2 is how we're thinking about it. But dividing by 2 isn't going to stop this from going to infinity, so this limit will equal infinity, which means the previous limit equals infinity, which means the previous limit equals infinity, which means this original sequence goes to infinity. So the limit, there are the sequence, diverges to infinity. So in this example, we have n factorial divided by n to the n. Remember that n factorial here means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. And then n to the n is just n multiplied by itself n times. So both of these expressions, again, go off to infinity. n factorial is going to go to infinity as n goes to infinity, and n to the n is going to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. The problem here is that we can't apply L'Hopital's rule because x infinity doesn't really make any sense, and x to the x is not a function that we really know how to take the derivative of. We could use logarithmic differentiation, but it's kind of a mess and not really the way that we want to approach this problem. So instead, we're going to show that this sequence is monotone and bounded. So it's a bit of a more advanced technique here, but that's a way that we can show that this sequence converges. So let's try to sh explain why this sequence is monotone, which either means strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, and then bounded just means that there's a, a high number and a low number, and all of the numbers in the sequence are in between those two numbers. So let's try to write out a few terms of this sequence to see why this is happening. One factorial divided by one to the one, that's just one over one, which is one. 2 factorial divided by 2 to the 2, that's 2 times 1 divided by 2 times 2, that's 1 half. 3 factorial divided by 3 to the 3, that's 3 times 2 times 1 divided by 3 times 3 times 3, so that's going to be 2 ninths. So let's pause here for a second and think about what's happening. Well, let's go one more, maybe it'll make it easier to see the pattern here. 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 divided by 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. So comparing each number to the number that came before it, 
what we're seeing here is that I've got two times one divided by two times two, and I've got something that kind of looks like that here, where the top is the same, but the bottom, the numbers went up. Instead of two times two on the bottom, I have three times three on the bottom. And then I just multiplied that by three times, three divided by three. So that part didn't change. So the part that changed was that I had the same fraction I had in the previous step, but the numbers on the bottom got bigger. So this decreased. And then from the third step to the fourth step, here's the fraction that I had before, three times two times one divided by three times three times three. And I can see something that looks kind of like that in the next step, where I have three times two times one still on the top, and the bottom, the numbers went up. They went from threes to fours. And then I multiplied that by four over four, so that didn't do anything. So that's also going to decrease because I made the denominator bigger. So at each step, I take the fraction that I had before, I make all the numbers on the bottom go up by one, and then that's the next number in the sequence. So each number in this sequence is going down from the number that came before, that's monotone. So this sequence is decreasing because of that pattern. Why is it bounded? Well, all of the numbers are positive. All of the numbers in the sequence are positive, so my a n here is greater than or equal to zero. And I start at one, and all of the numbers go down, right? So the maximum number in this sequence is one. And so all of the a sub n's, all of the numbers in this sequence, are fractions between 0 and 1. So they're all fractions between 0 and 1, and the sequence is decreasing. It's going down at each step. And so one of the theorems that we learned in this section tells us that this sequence must converge. It doesn't tell us what it converges to. In fact, as it turns out, this converges to 0. That's not uh, something that we can tell from this analysis. But the sequence converges, and then we can do some more analysis to try to figure out what it converges to. So like I said, a little bit of an advanced technique in this last one, but try to take the ideas that we've talked about in this lecture, in this, uh, this video, and apply it to the problems that you're working on. Good luck.